This is the Self Taught or Not podcast with Dylan Israel and Eric Hanchett, where we teach you the do's and don'ts of software development from two software development professionals, one self taught and one not. Hey guys, before we get started with our latest episode, diving into all the great things that the text editor and IDE VS Code has to offer and how to make the most of it, I'd like to do a shout out to one of my latest courses, the 100 Front End Interview Questions Challenge. It's a course designed around the most common questions you're going to get when interviewing for a front end role. There will be a link in the show notes or the description below. Go ahead and check it out. All right, so today we have something I'm very excited about because uh, I like giving my buddy a hard time because he uses uh, PHP, Storm, and WebStorm, but we're talking about VS Code. What I consider, and I think probably in, in the TypeScript, JavaScript realm, probably the more popular um, editor or IDE, and I'm, I'm pretty excited to talk about some of the items that I use in it and how to maybe streamline your workflow as well as just make it a little bit, make your job easier, right? Automate what you can automate. What was your text editor before VS Code? Were you like an Atom guy or were you using Sublime or anything else? Yeah, so I definitely did both of those, right? So if you want to go in the Wayback Machine, uh, the first text editor, that, if you want to call it that, that I used was CodePen. So I basically just started using CodePen. I really liked it at the time and didn't really know any better. When you're just building you know, basic HTML, CSS, and JavaScript stuff, and jQuery at that time. It was great, and I got to see it all on the screen. After that, I moved on to, I want to say it's Brackets, then Sublime, then Atom, and finally, I've been with VS Code for a couple of years now. Like, I I don't know. Like, I, it, it's, um you know, we talked about this with the package managers. It, it seems like they sort of have created the mark, like, it is, I, I don't know that there's going to be a, there's going to be like more complex ID, IDs rather, but as far as text editors go, they've sort of, uh, they've nailed it, I guess. Yeah, I mean, it's pretty amazing. And I think it's it's like the standard nowadays. I mean, just going down memory lane for me, I remember back in, way, way back in the day, people said, you want to create a web page? Notepad. You remember that? Like people creating websites using notepad or then then notepad plus plus because it added a few features and it added in plugins um when i really started getting into text editors and and then ides was when i started a job where we had to remote into these unix boxes and we had to learn things like nano and then vim it was either nano vim or emacs and i just really liked Vim. So I just started down the Vim, which is more of a text editor, but it can become a full development editor as well. So I really dived, deep dived into Vim at the time. And then as I kind of moved my way, my through my, my way through and learned more, I started using Vim a little bit less. And then I started using just like you, I think I, I tried brackets for a while. And then I, I don't I never tried Sublime, even though I think I had like the free version for a while that had like the the pop up that would annoy you every now and then that you needed to buy. And then I tried Adam because I, I remember for a while everybody's like Adam's the best best ever. And it's still for those of you still using Adam, it's pretty good, you know, and if you're happy with it, I would say don't stop using it. But then VS Code just kind of took over and, and just gained all this popularity probably in the last I don't know three or four or five years. I might maybe yeah, not that long. It's definitely hard to compete when you're working with organizations that like Microsoft that are maintaining it full time and having it be one of those items where it's a staple of their stack. It's it's one of the something that they've gone out of their way to really make it, you know, much like TypeScript. They're they're dedicating time and energy and there's a lot of community aspect that go to it as well. Um sort of on this topic of uh text editors and IDs. I remember just five years ago when I was trying to get my first, this was maybe about a month and a half before I landed my first dev role. I remember there was this shitty little web dev shop. Uh, that this, so this guy uh, who kind of looked like he was out of the trailer park boys had like a, was eating like a salad and he had like a Bluetooth head, uh, headpiece in. And he basically told me, I should say basically his exact quote was that real devs use dream Re- weaver. And uh, even with no resume experience, I knew that wasn't the place for me. So I ended up turning that job down. Do you think it's like trolling you? 
<laughs> yeah, I, n- no, it, not at all, man. Like, it's just, it was one of those places. And people ask oftentimes, like, how can you tell a good workplace from a bad workplace? And oftentimes during the interview process, it's very apparent when they sort of talk down to you and they they sort of tell you how you're shit, but they're going to make you all right. Like, that's usually a good uh, indication of probably a place you don't want to be. But it was, it was, it was, it's to this day, I very remember, it was like on one of those like $10 TV trays that you would get uh, from, uh, from like Walmart that fold up. And I just... I just remember getting there and getting the sales pitch and all this sort of stuff and him telling me how awful I was and this is going to make me better. And then, um, you know, they're going to start me at $12 an hour, but I could like go get up much higher and all this sort of stuff and how they had this secret SEO sauce. that was the bread and butter of their business. Dude, I'm telling you, it was, it was it's just comical. That's the, that's all it is. <laughs> and they called me two years later. Um, at this point I have two years of resume experience. And they called me two years later and was like, hey, we still have your resume. Are you interested in a job? Um, you, we can get, go as high as uh, $18 an hour. And like, I, I, I was like, well, I, I, you know, I just, I just hit him with a number. I was like, well, um, you know, I probably, I'm not considering anything under at that time, 40, $45 an hour, whatever it was. And they're like, oh, good luck with that. And just hung up with on me. <laughs> it's just like, there's uh, so, there's, I that is so funny because I think I had a similar experience, but but there's so many like these little companies out there that you know had one or two web developers that've been there forever. They think they know everything, but they're just so behind in every little thing. And and developers, it's not you know we talk about web development and being pretty highly paid skill to have, and that people are getting you know hundred thousand dollars a a year. But there's still a lot of these little companies out there there that they're paying people fifteen dollars an hour, twenty, you know, ten dollars an hour to do web development and they think that's like really, really good. I mean, and it's just funny that you said that and just people are so crazy. I think crazy yeah. is a good word. It was a it was a defining experience in, in some aspects during interviewing. Um but yeah, that's my little uh text editor story um (laughs) let's let's talk about let's jump in here um since i think we both have decided vs code is the way to go and talk a little bit about how we kind of our setup for vs code and i'm really interested to hear what dylan has um and 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 let let me start though let let me go ahead and start so i use vs code and for the longest time i used vanilla vs code so i was one of those people who were like installed great i'm going to use it and then i kind of deep dived into the world of extensions and if you don't know that's like the plugins inside the vs code world and so i started with really the first extension that i really started with is vim so I mentioned before that I used to do Vim because I was doing server work and I had a remote in SSH into these boxes. So you can get a Vim plugin for for VS Code that essentially makes it just like you're using the Vim editor. So all your key bindings work. You you have to hit escape and and don't worry. The classic thing with Vim is no one knows how to exit Vim. You don't have to worry about that because you because you still just use the mouse to exit VS uh, VS Code. But it, it just kind of made a lot of sense to me, and it has a lot of hotkeys, so I can easily jump to the top of, of the file, to the bottom of the file, to the middle. You know, I can go down, page down, or page up. I can get to the front of a sentence, the end of a sentence. I can go word by word. I can go word by word back. I can highlight and do complete changes to text really easy using regular expression. Now, a lot of these things are kind of built into VS Code now, if you know the right hotkeys. But I knew the Vim hotkey, so that's kind of where I started with. And let's. How about we go back and forth? How, what's one extension that you use that you really like? Well, before we get in extensions, I think it's worth mentioning about the settings that you can do in VS Code and some of the items that I add there. Um, so one thing, sure. I'm, I'm obviously very big on TypeScript, and I love that I can customize pretty much anything I want. So there's things that I like, like Word Wrap. I don't ever think it makes sense to have your editor go horizontal. It's like a web page, right? You don't have a web page go horizontal, uh, and you, your editor shouldn't either. And so you should see what's there. Now, 
So I turn that on always. I also turn on things like um, format on type, uh, format on save, format on paste, all these sort of settings to make sure that my auto formatting, as well as my linting, you can turn on your TS lint to do that and updating of imports. So if you change an import, uh, cause you rename a file, it goes and edits your, your whole project to say, Hey, we change this file, uh, import path and resave it. So it's very powerful. Uh, and th those are some of the cooler settings that I like quite a bit. I've tried, I, I definitely have, I think a, a, the right way to use VS Code, and maybe not the right way, but one way I like, it's exactly like you, is I always make sure that if I'm using React, Vue, or Angular, that I have the ESLint settings set up correctly, and that the ESLint settings, there's an ESLint plugin f uh, extension for VS Code that will essentially tell you if you have something formatted in the wrong way, and then it'll auto format for you. And I think the auto formatting, I'm not sure if that's a part, I don't think that's a part of ESLint. It just gives you the errors, but you can install things like prettier. And maybe VS Code, if you put format on save, I'm not sure if you have to have prettier installed to do that or beautify, which is another one, or if it VS Code will do without those two. I'm not sure. It, it, de it depends. So you might use an extension like editor config editor config is a nice extension so that it handles some of those prettier type of elements such as spacing and, and commas and um, there's only about 10 settings in editor config but the idea there is that this is your standard like hey the standard sort of pretty and formatting so that if you're using uh, webstorm and i'm using you know vs code it can still sync up uh but i i do think that uh you know they're they're probably is some sort of formatting that because it needs to know how to format it right yeah yeah i've had situations too where like you have a discrepancy between your es lint and your prettier config and maybe the what's the, the built-in one of vs code the es config like you have a you have a like a problem between a few of them and then you save and then it try to it it reformats it the wrong way and then your ES lint comes up and underlines it and says we oh, have a problem here. You do have to take some caution when you're setting up your environment that way. All your linting rules, all the tools that you use to auto format are working correctly. But to make a long story short, I think that's excellent an excellent idea to have all those in there. Do you use let me ask you this the way I like to set up is I have multiple monitors and I'll have VS code open up on like my largest monitor, my like 25 inch, 27 inch. And then I'll have it split to two panes. And then I'll usually use the hotkeys. I think it's command one, command two. You can switch between the different panes. You can also use command bar to like create another pane. You can also close it. So I'm like constantly like, switching between the two different split screen of it and then using command p which or excuse me command yeah command p on the mac i don't know if it's shift p to search for files control p so it'd be control would be the the windows version or the, as i like to say the correct version whoa for all our mac users out there <laughs> so is that is that particularly how you like to work so it depends if I'm at home or on my work laptop nowadays. Um, I, I typically, yes. So I, I have multiple monitors. I have three right now. I used to have four, but I, I have, uh, I gave one to April to work with her and set up, but on my work laptop for a while, I wasn't able to have a second monitor and I just sort of got accustomed to it. And nowadays I'm not really working on anything where I need to reference something. Um, it's, the it's like i've worked in the same technology for a year or two now and same idea that any issue i've come across isn't something i even need to reference i can pretty much write you know 50 lines of code at a time see that it works and then you know especially if i'm doing testing in the process but uh if it's like a side project i like to have my text editor on one a browser on another monitor and then uh probably youtube on the third one <laughs> third one as i'm working on something um so occasionally I might split up the panes and of course, you know, that you mentioned hotkeys like uh, command or control uh, P to jump between files and whatnot. But that's typically what I do. And in the bottom, 
uh, VS Code, you have the ability uh, right above the little blue toolbar line. If you pull it up, you can get a terminal, which I always have my test running right there, um, just like maybe an inch or two to see that nothing's broken as I've been going and you know coding. I've I've kind of done yeah I like the built-in terminal inside VS Code. It's easy to bring it up, but a lot of times what I do too is is I'll have the built-in Mac terminal, and then I'm a Tmux user, which is like a multiplexer. It allows you to create extra terminals really quickly, or if you're old school, you can use screen, and then you can easily like create different. I'll have like three or four different terminals going and using Tmux and I'll switch between them and then I'll maybe start a couple different apps, maybe start the back end in a couple different terminals and have that going. And then I'll have a VS Code session going and I'll open up the terminal there if I need to like run tests or something. I think that's a good way to to, to run tests. Uh, you know, I, I f- you know, I really feel like these shortcuts that we're talking about are, are going to be the differences between you know, t- taking a, let's say you're assigned a story, it could shape hours, maybe days, if it's a really big project off your pro- off your off your workload. Because just being able to use your your development editor quickly just makes things so much faster. So being able to switch between different files quickly, being able to quickly, um, you know, run a test in your terminal, being able to search like the whole folder one thing i like too is i think it's uh it's command shift f on the mac where you can search every single file for any sort of text i use that all the time when i need to quickly search if you're in the command line you can use something like grep but like being able to search for something finding the areas you need to change doing find and replaces i usually always end up doing it manually instead of like just doing a broad file in place and listen completely sure that every instance I need to change. But it really makes the difference. And then being able to easily go into your code editor and then when you're in the file, be able to to go to the section that you need to quickly, be able to delete the sections. I know a, a, neat, a neat handy since we're talking about shortcuts. There's a way, I think it's, com- we're going to put a, a cheat sheet in the description of this episode, but there's ways you can grab any text and just move it by using the up and down arrows so you can easily place it in between opening and closing tags especially if you're dealing with html that is super helpful there's ways you can hi- do multiple multiple cursors so you can hi- highlight two or three different texts that all the same name and then you can delete all of them at the same time and then type something all at the same time which is really handy um, I think those are the ones I use most, other than just moving the cursor around between the front of a line, end of a line, deleting lines, things like that. Yeah, there's. I mean, you could go crazy remembering, you know, I, I would say probably there's five to six hotkeys that I know offhand, but there's, there's more that I should probably learn, right? Um, the one that I use quite frequently is... Um, was it control shift alt i got i even i sometimes you just don't even remember what it is you just do it automatically but where you go and you you essentially can click on line one two three four five and then you start typing it puts it in all this pl- the places or like you want to delete something uh, on multiple lines that's one of my more uh, favorite ones yep yep uh, for sure uh, is there any other hotkeys you want to talk about before we no, talk let's more talk about extensions. Or... Yeah, let's talk about extensions. So you had asked me about um, some, you know, what are some extensions I like? One that I've recently started using, I like it so much, I've built it into um, not only my local applications, but also my work applications. Is one called C Spell, which stands for Code Spell Checker. So I actually run this in a Husky Git command because you can also install it as an npm package that allows you to essentially spell check your application. So before our app, before you can actually push up even to your repo, it will do a spell check on all of your, you know, I, we have a setup for HTML, CSS, and, and JavaScript, all our files basically, except JSON and polyfills to make sure that you didn't misspell anything, whether it's your function name, whether there's text, all that sort of stuff, and make sure it's properly cased. And uh, there's a nice extension that you don't have to go as deep as that to install the NPM package, but it will highlight any spelling issues that you may have in your application for you. That sounds pretty handy. 
Uh, let me, let's just go, I'll go ahead and go with my next one. We talked a little bit about Prettier. So Prettier's extension that does the auto formatting of a lot of really fun things. So if you want to set it up, so let's say you have a, you need a semicolon at the end of each code block. It'll make sure that your semicolons are here or there. If you want to use single quotes or double quotes, that's pretty common. Some companies want all their JavaScript to have single quotes. Um, you can set that up that way. And what it'll do is it'll detect if there's any problems. And then if you have format on save, it'll save it. And then it'll automatically convert like the single quote to a double quote or double quote to single quote, or it'll add the semicolon. And it just formats it really nicely. Like maybe you have you have too many, you don't have enough spaces or tabs between different places, it'll automatically format it so it looks correctly. By the way, we kind of touched on this a little earlier. It's really easy to not be in sync with your team members if you're using something like Prettier or Beautify. There's, there's another one called Beautify. I haven't used it, but I, it's similar. It kind of does auto formatting. So I've had times where I've pushed up code that I thought were, was formatted and then one of my coworkers, you know, a week later, a couple weeks later, they push up code to that same for that same file, and their prettier configuration is a little different than mine, and it formats it differently. And so, what you'll happen when you try to do like a code review, there might be like a hundred changes in that file, and all they are is weird white space changes or adding a semicolon or removing a semicolon. And it makes it really difficult to do code reviews because you're, now you're looking at 100 changes and you're not sure which ones were because of the formatting and what was actually changed. So be careful on that. I've had that happen a few times. Yeah, and, and to solve that, because you know most of these, Prettier, for example, is what I use in my project, is you, you typically can install um, NPM extensions that will extend like TSLint or ESLint and have a, a JSON uh, for Prettier, like a Prettier RC file. And that will keep it all in sync because that will take precedent uh, in your project over whatever your local extension settings are. So that that can usually help with that. Yep. Yeah, so, if we've uh, done that, there's also one that I use quite. A... Oh, Go ahead. I was going to add one more thing to that one, just to say um, uh, one the prettier thing too. One thing I've heard some companies do. So if you're going into an old code base and then you add in prettier later on, and it formats all the files and then you're making changes to those files, you could do the to commit um, trick, not really a trick, but to commit strategy where you save, you make like a, a white space change, you save the file so it formats it the correct way, and you do that for every file you're gonna change. Then you commit them all to your repository, but not, you don't um, merge it, but just make, create a commit for it and push it up to whatever GitHub or GitLabs, whatever you're using. And then you start working on those files. And then the code reviewer can see that you did two commits. The first commit being just the format changes, where it just auto-formatted. And the second one will be the real changes. And then they can see what the real changes are. Just another kind of quick tip there. Yeah, and, and on that same note, one way that I've also gone about solving this is, um, and this is why some people think I'm a pain in the ass because I force all these things. I, I Again, I try to automate everything. So uh, on that same, um, now on commit or on push, I forget how I've set it up, Prettier has something called Pretty Quick, which uh, if you're using Husky or Git hooks, you can essentially go and when someone does a push, it's going to auto format their files based off that Prettier RC file. So you sort of force everybody to be in sync. Um, that's one way I've also gone about it. It slows down maybe your pushes a little bit, which can be kind of frustrating because it's not the fastest thing in the world. So maybe you're used to your push being five seconds, but now it's spell checking. Now it's uh, formatting every file you touched. And by the end of it, it might take 30 seconds to a minute. Pretty neat. Yeah. Uh, one thing I've done in a couple of videos is I've used Browser Preview. Browser Preview is a nice little extension that pops up a browser in your VS Code um, um editor so that you can actually see something right then and there if you're working on one monitor and i've used this not only for like um, code examples where i'm going through it in, on youtube but also when i'm mentoring some some developers it really helps when you're you know especially working remote where you are pairing and you jump between text editor to monitor text editor to monitor can kind of slow that down and maybe um, disconnect the idea 
a little bit. That's been a, another great extension I, I use uh, pretty frequently. I've used that a few times. Definitely recommend it. Yeah, just for a quick preview. Um, I'm I'm one of those guys too. If you have multiple monitors, you can just kind of look at it, the other monitor to see it refreshing. Which I'm gonna have a little mini rant for a second. Why is it that some tools you change CSS a second later, it just shows up in your text editor in your browser window, like it has like automatic refreshing, and then some has to reload the whole app every time you change it, and that's the problem with Angular. Make a little change of CSS it has to refresh the whole page. Um, with their default Angular CLI setup. I do not like that. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Am I the only one that doesn't like that? I I look at it as it's part of the code too, right? It's like I, I think there's a little bit of, uh, you know, if you're working on the front end, your CSS, your JavaScript, your HTML, it's all intertwined, right? That, especially if you're taking the React approach where React is like, you know, there it's a single thing even if it's broken up in Angular, they're still all working together. So like to me, it makes sense that there'd be a full page refresh. I just don't know. Like Our app is pretty big, so every time we refresh, it just it adds and you know seconds, and those seconds add up. And if you're working on a pretty complicated feature where you're continuously going to have to refresh to see what the changes are, it just it like adds you know minutes, minutes become hours. It just becomes a, a long time of you just sitting there waiting for the app to refresh to show your little CSS change. So that ends up what you end up doing is you end up like doing a bunch of CSS changes all at once, hoping it all works, and then refreshing, and then then saving, and then looking at oh did it update or not. While on the other hand, if you used a tool like Vue CLI, and I'm not sure about React. I think React CLI works this way, depending on if what kind of CSS, what kind of library you're using for CSS. It'll automatically refresh. It will automatically change without a refresh, and that's really nice because then it just pops up and it takes like half a second. I wonder um, if there's a uh, like an Angular JSON setting for that. I don't because there could be. I mean, I've never looked at it. A lot hmm. of times when I'm dealing with that situation, I just do it directly in the inspector, be like to make sure, and I'd be like, okay, this works, and I'll go and put it in, save it. Then once I have it working. Yeah, that's another good tip. I mean, just overall, explain that tip for people who may not understand. Yeah, so oftentimes when you're working in HTML and CSS, and you sort of, I think this is going to work. And CSS at times, even even for myself, is a little bit of black magic on those times. You're like, why isn't this working? And so you're going, you're trying something, it doesn't work. You're going, you're trying something, it doesn't work. And to Eric's point, that can be very frustrating and take a little bit of time. So Oftentimes, what I do is I, I open up the uh, browser inspector. I'll select the element that I want to that I'm trying to put that on, and then I'll you know I'll play around in the CSS and the classes and and the styles that, f that I want to see. Oh, I think this will do it. If it doesn't work, I'll try something else. And there's no refresh. You're just essentially manipulating the DOM directly. I'm speechless. Very, very cool. Yeah, that, that's a, that's a really good way. And you find out that you don't do you can that. Do, like, no, I I do do that. I okay. I have done that. Um, I don't do it quite as often because a lot of our apps are a lot of forms. Also, one more mini rant before, and we'll get back on topic. I feel like like there is when you're adding in these CSL CSS, CSS elements. Properties, is that what we're going to want to call them? Properties to a class that there's really no, uh, you know, I'll, I'll get on this topic in the future. I just think that it's pretty fragmented. I know some designers, if they look at you putting in, some designers like have these very styled classes and they reuse them throughout their app and it makes a whole lot of sense and they have a global file. And it makes a lot of sense. And then I see a lot of CSS where it's just all over the place. Like you have like all the CSS classes are repeating in slightly different ways all over the app. It's all scoped to different components. And the global, there's not that many globals. And it feels like the standards for CSS are getting better, but it's it still, still has a way to go. And I guess it just depends a lot on the developer and their experience with CSS. Yeah, and that most developers are garbage in the front end. Like, the, <laughs> like, like that, I mean, that's the truth of the matter. The majority of my job, 
a lot of times is fixing the things that other developers patched and hacked together. So like those standards exist, they're just not followed, right? So you should go through, you know, if you if you're building a basic application, you should go through and, you know, define what a paragraph looks like, what a H1, what a what a standard UL and nav and you shouldn't be, you know, scoping every single thing and, you know, repeating yourself time and time again. The reason we have to do that is because people, you know, people are just thrown in and they don't they i mean i i could rant for a year about how developers repeat that first year 20 times and never get any better uh but because you listen to the self-taught or not podcast i know you guys aren't one of those developers so um let's uh i digress let's get back to extensions right all right let me jump in the next extension let's uh the one i like i've used this a few times it's live share it's a pretty neat extension that allows you to share your VS code with someone else in the office or anywhere, really. They can connect to, it's almost like a remote control or if you were doing pair programming. It has some limitations, but it basically you share the same code text editor. You can install it on multiple people's VS code and everybody can kind of do a pair programming session. Yeah, is that out of beta? I I haven't checked it out in a while. I've I've used it with a couple colleagues in the past uh, about a year ago, and it was like an alpha or beta at that time. Uh, yeah, it's I think it's out out of alpha or beta right now. I last time I used, it, I don't remember it saying anything about alpha or beta. Nice. Um, one one extension I've used quite for quite some time since I started using VS Code, uh, years back, and it seems to be one of the more popular ones nowadays is bracket pair colorizer, which allows our, our brackets and our curly braces to be colored based off of nesting. So you can see a little bit clearer where something is. And I, I've I've absolutely loved it ever since I've used it. Yeah, anything that kind of helps define things better in your app is, is nicer and having the different colored brackets I like. Uh, let's, let's, uh, let's talk a little about another one, Quokka. Uh, this is a a really neat extension. I've used it with more of with my live coding and my YouTube, but it essentially allows you to have a text editor, basically a, a kind of a scratch pad in VS Code open. You can paste code in there, you can type code in there, and it automatically runs it for you. You can also import in other code and have it run. It even supports NPM packages. And so it's kind of like giving you a little scratch pad to, to try out some code and, and see if it works before putting it into your app. And it actually shows right inside VS Code, the code running. And you can even see like where the variables are at. And in fact, you can use it just not just for scratch pad. You can take one of your project files, turn Quokka on, and then just see. It'll go through it and it'll show you exactly what all the output of all the code is. Which is, which is pretty neat. Have Have you ever used this? Yeah, I've used it quite a bit for um, exactly what you said. Where when I was doing tutorials and I wanted to demo it instead of having to pull up like a console browser, I uh, just seeing it right there. It's been really helpful. And uh, similar to how I use Browser Preview when I would be doing a little bit of mentoring or uh, knowledge transferring, I'd use it for that as well in the workplace. Yeah, and uh, let me just end this with. They're the same person that creates Quokka created one called Wallaby, which if you're doing, if your company is serious about testing, it's an excellent extension as well because it adds this gutter on the left-hand side that actually runs your tests in real time in VS Code. And it'll show you green for passing, red for failing. So at any time you can see, oh, all these tests are passing, all these tests are failing. And then you get the same kind of uh, scratch pad Quokka interface where you can type in your tests and you, they they be they'll automatically run. You can see the outputs of them. You can do print statements and console statements. When I was first moved to Angular and I needed to start doing tests, we use typically with Angular we use what's called a test bed, which runs it kind of mounts the whole component up and it it runs everything. And I had no idea like how any of these tests were running. And it was really complicated. But when I installed Quokka and then I installed Wallaby, it just made things so much easier. And I could easily troubleshoot like where my tests were running, why they were failing, you know, console output, things that were failing. It was really nice. 
Yeah, it's uh, gotta love the angular test, but <laughs> uh, not my not my favorite thing in the world. That that uh, as far as angular goes, um, although I quite quite big on testing. Um, one little extension that I I like quite a bit, and it's sort of funny. I I can't actually believe that this is just isn't a standard feature of VS Code or um. I, I guess I understand. So like um, it's auto rename tag. So when working with HTML, if you go and like, hey, I'm going to change this span to a div. Oftentimes you have to go and edit not only the closing tag, but also the opening tag, which is just like, oh, why am I duplicating the effort? Obviously, I don't want to just have one and one. And so I've installed this little thing uh, called auto rename tag, which is quite nice. I like it. I like there's another one, too, that automatically closes your tags. Do you use yeah, that auto, one? Auto, auto close tag. Yeah, I also use that. <laughs> <laughs> Say, yeah, use auto rename tag. So when you rename it, change it, and then auto close tag. So that way, when you start typing it, it just adds the the close tag. Both are very helpful. Uh, I I also use uh, the debugger for Chrome. Yeah, I I don't know why this is not built in either, but you can install an extension. It adds the debugger. I kind of go back and forth in the debugger. Sometimes I use the debugger in VS Code, and sometimes. I just go into Chrome itself. You can add breakpoints pretty easily. If you have source maps on, you can even search for the actual exact file that you made changes to and then add breakpoints in there and and do it that way. I know it's I guess it depends on your preference if what you like better. Yeah, I, uh if you're in if you like uh statistics and you just want to sort of see how many lines of code you have by programming language. This is something that I just was like, this would be kind of cool to see how much I've written in this project. Um, like, actually, there's a extension called VS Code Counter, which will you can go and run a little command, and it will go and say you have this many lines of JSON, this many lines of CSS, this many lines of you know TypeScript, blah blah blah. Um, it's just more of a fun thing. I haven't actually ever used it in like a real project, but a, a fun little um, you know, if you like stats, a good thing to play around with. I like it. There's also GitLens. I use I've used this a few times, uh, quite a few times. So every single line of your code, you'll you can click on any line and then see the last time that line was changed. You can actually click on a button and see the commit history. So if something broke, you can go into the file, take a look at the last person that broke it without having to pull up, you know, GitHub or you know, use the command line for Git. Assuming that you use Git or GitLab, uh, and it just makes it a little bit nicer and a little bit easier to figure out. And you can also look at stashed files. I use stashing all the time, so I'll be in a file, and then all of a sudden, and there's probably a few ways to do this. I wonder how you do this, Dylan. I sometimes I'll be in a file, and all of a sudden I have to switch to a, another branch. So I'll I'll run git stash real quickly. I'll go to the other branch, do whatever I need to do, go back to my branch, and then and then get stash pop, which puts the files back where they were. And then rather than committing those when I'm halfway through them, and then I have to figure that out. And um, get lens also allows you to like look at all the stashed files that you have in. Yeah, I, I mean, I typically do a similar process, although I, I don't use get lens. Um, but one extension I do use that's get related is get blame, which lets you uh, when you select a line, it tells you who edit it last and then you can um if you it'll be in your little blue uh action bar and if you click it it'll actually take you to the um to the pull request or the you know the commit that so you can see what actually happened um more so it's just so i can spam people and be like yo you broke this shit dude why <laughs> <laughs> yeah that sounds like it lens but it's a little different uh one one two is uh, i like is called rest client there's a few of these. This one kind of gives you like an editor to do um, rest calls. There, There's a few ways of doing this. Some people use curl. Some people use Postman, I think is pretty popular. Um, but if you don't want to use Postman or, or curl, then you can kind of do it inside VS Code with this extension and, and then do these requests. And then you could see the outputs. You can use promises and everything like that. Have Do you guys... I wonder what what do you guys use? Uh, in in I mean, we follow REST standards. I don't. We don't necessarily use an extension to do that. I mean, do you what do you use to do like 
calls to the back end to test? Do you have like a Postman? Do you have oh, like yeah, Swagger yeah. files? Um, so we have Swagger files, and then but you we can also use Postman. It really just depends. Although I think nowadays, all the uh, from what April tells me about the people in the boot camp, they're using Insomnia, which I haven't used quite yet, but it it just looks like a cooler, hipper version of Postman. <laughs> Oh, I haven't heard of it either. I'll have to check that out. Pretty neat. Yeah, um, one, one last one on mine that I that I've used quite a bit for simpler projects. You know, you're just doing something not with a framework where it has its own server. Is Live Server, where oh, I have HTML and CSS and JavaScript, and I want I wish it would refresh on save. You Live Server gives you that ability where essentially it runs a server on your index.html file, and anything that changes will then reload. Uh, which is something I used quite a bit when I was actually learning to code. I've used a couple of tools, but mostly command line. There's like an HTTP server, like an NPM module you can install globally that does something similar. There's also a Python, like pretty much a Python command that you can run a server really quickly. But it's nice that's all built into VS Code, or you can get an extension that does that. I think that's all I have for extensions. I do have a lot of, probably like you, Dylan, I have a, a lot of, technology specific extensions or framework specific extensions for example in in view i use vtor i use also i'm a big fan of snippets too so i have like view 2 snippets view 3 snippets i also have on the angular side there's a john papa created like a whole repository of snippets i think dan whalen has some snippet ones and then there's also i have like an angular 2 switcher which I makes it really easy with a hotkey to switch between my HTML, CSS, and TypeScript files. Just by pressing a button, I could switch to each one of them without having to type it out. Uh, and types, you know, there's like a TypeScript extension that I use, and then there's a few React extensions of, of that I use as well. Yeah, pretty much any any language, any library, any framework that you're working on, there's always going to be some extensions directly related to that to make your life a little bit easier. You know, I've I've talked about TS Lint for instance quite a bit, so um, we could be here all day going over that. But um, if you are thinking, oh man, I wish they had it for I don't know Scala, I promise you, there's a Scala extension. You just gotta uh, search for it in the in the extension marketplace. For sure. Uh, we're going to round this. Uh, it's getting a little long, but let's talk a little bit longer and then we'll wrap it up. Um, do you, let's talk about fonts and then we're going to quickly talk about themes. So uh, themes is a pretty big topic. There's a lot of themes. In fact, I just did a YouTube video a while back on some of my favorite VS Code themes. And literally I got hundreds of comments and everybody seems to like different themes. Um, so let's start with fonts. I, I, for the longest time, I just used the default font in VS Code. I didn't even change it. And then just recently, I don't know, in the last year or two, I, sw I switched to Firecoda, which is a free open source font that's really neat. Um, and I use that with ligatures turn on. If you don't know what ligatures are, they're a way in your font to, like if you do equal, equal, it kind of combines it into one equal, equal, and has two lines. It kind of looks a little nicer. So same thing with like the fat arrow functions. They kind of turn into one arrow function instead of equal sign and and uh, like a greater than sign. So it does kind of those kind of neat things. And I just like the the visual style of it. Yeah, I mean that's that's what it's all about, right? Um, I for the most part use the default one. Occasionally, if I'm really tired and I don't want to go to work, I'll put on the light theme where it just blasts your eyes awake. Uh, but for the most part, I'm just a default guy. I haven't really felt the need to go and sort of experiment, right? They, it comes with about 10 different ones that you can uh, get. Are, are you talking about themes or are you talking yeah, about themes, fonts? themes. Oh, okay. Same with fonts. I don't, I don't touch the font just because I haven't had the need. I do because I'm because my eyes are getting tired. I do increase the font size by default in my settings uh, to be a little bit bigger. But um, it's always weird to me when I, because uh, a couple of my, my colleagues use a different, uh, they like one uses high contrast, which just feels like just everything is popping out. Like it's, it's a very sort of like dark, but blocky theme. But for the most part, I just use the standard dark visual studio code theme. It feels like the, the more brighter themes, they're like bleach in my eye after a while. I'm like, ah, I can't do this. I know some people love the the brighter themes. I don't do any bright themes. I'm I'm team dark. Yeah. 
so I'll tell you guys for you guys who are interested in themes, the ones I use. And when you, I talk about themes in VS Code, this changes usually just the look and feel of just the colors in the text editor, in the sidebars, sometimes the top of the of VS Code, and then it changes maybe the text colors as well. So that's usually what the theme affects. The one I really like, and I think this has really blown up in the last couple of years, is Synthwave 84. And Synthwave 84, it kind of has this retro 80s feel to it. If you've watched the trailer for... Uh, what's uh, Superwoman? Yeah, Superwoman. Wonder, Wonder Woman. Wonder Woman. Thank you. <laughs> I got my got it mixed up. Wonder Woman. It has the the new one is like in the eighties, and it has the logo. It's all that neon glow and kind of weird like retro vibe to it. That's what this theme looks like. In fact, one of the things one of the things that stands out in the Synthwave eighty four theme is you can turn on glowing. So some of the text glows a little bit and it just makes it like a little bit of a stylish flourish that makes it look really cool. I think I've used it for a long time. I've never had problems with, with my eyes hurting or anything like that. And it's pretty neat. And in fact, every time I joked, every time I do YouTube video with Synthwave 84 on, there's at least half a, do well, at least two or three comments, sometimes half a dozen of people asking me what theme I'm using because people, it kind of stands out a little bit. Yeah, yeah, I just checked it out right now. It's it's uh it's a little spicy. Uh it's soft on the eyes, it's nice. So if you're if you're feeling like you want a little bit of retro in your life, you want to spice it up a bit, I could definitely see the uh the appeal. Um and it's it's kind of, sort of strange sort of when you think about the fonts and sizing and like uh themes, but you spend a lot of time looking at a text editor as a, as a developer and taking that 20 30 minutes to figure out what you like once a year can really make the world a difference. You can, especially, yeah, we, we stare at this stuff all day long, and it's not fun. Let me tell you, I'm just going to rattle off a few more that I like, and I think we should do a bigger theme episode. Or maybe we can kind of combine this theme stuff into a different episode. But It might be kind of hard, given that it's a <laughs> podcast to talk about something that's only visual, right? Yeah, you might be right. Another few that I like is the cobalt tooth theme this is also known as the west boss theme he actually created it west boss is somewhat famous developer that runs a, a a different podcast on on development and he also creates courses online but he has this 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 really nice looking theme it has kind of kind of uh, greens dark browns it's a dark theme it it looks pretty good to me. I've I've used it and and looked at it quite a few times. For the longest time, I used the default winter is coming theme, which I think is built into VS Code default, which is just kind of a nice dark theme for it. Uh, a few others that I really like have been I I like the super super dark ones. There's one dark pro, which uh, is another theme. In fact, when I asked everyone what their favorite theme was on my YouTube channel, One Dark Pro was one of the highest rated. It kind of looks like the West Boss theme a little bit, just slightly different colors on it. And then let's see here. I'll, I'll mention one more. Uh, some people really like the Dracula theme. It's another really nice dark theme. And then there is, I'm just kind of looking through right now my VS Code all my themes that I installed recently. Um, there's IU, IU a dark meta, which is a super dark theme. It's like everything's black except the text. And uh, that's another one that I really like. So that's, that's it. The only other thing I wanted to mention is I do use, which is kind of related to themes. I've kind of played around. You can change the fonts, not the fonts, but the icons on when you open a file. So inside your VS Code, you have the Explorer on the left-hand side and and they have little icons next to each file. And I installed the Material icon fonts and I think that looks pretty good. Do you, do you use uh, icon fonts for your Explorer in VS Code? Uh, not anymore. I have in the past, but it's like when I change computers, I you know, got to reset it up if you don't have your settings synced. And I... I 
it wasn't enough of a like I didn't miss it enough to be like oh I should go install this again. And then I also I turned off the mini map in my my uh, VS Code. I just hated that thing. I never used it. And then I also changed my call length. I've been changing between 120 and 180, and I don't have word wrap on, so I am one of the weird people that actually vertically scroll over to the side sometimes. But most of the time, my monitor is big enough. It's not a big deal. No, I, I think and, I'm in the minority of word wrap because I any developer I've worked with, they're just like disgusted. Like that, that I have word wrap on. Like, what is this? This is oh my god! Uh, but it's uh, usually not too much of an issue. One one thing I did want to mention though is that if you haven't used VS Code and you're thinking of checking it out, uh, there's a bunch of a lot of these themes. Like One Dark Pro is a uh, theme from Ad- Adam's Dark Theme. They can make that transition relatively easily, as well as the key bindings from those. So you can actually go and import um, some key bindings and settings so that you don't have to relearn all these hotkeys. You can just go to a new text editor that maybe is a little bit more verbose and um, maybe you know is continually being worked on as well. That is a smooth transition. So That's a good point. Do you, when, your word pre- when your word wrap is on, it doesn't save it, though. If you save it and it's word wrapped... Yeah, no, no, it, it just... No, it doesn't It's just it. for you to see it, right? Exactly. Got it. And then... Uh, one last thing: Do you change spacing? Like you can change it to like either have a tab be three or four spaces, and I just left the default. I don't even know. I, know uh, some I, are... I mean, it's based off the formatting nowadays. So, um, I if I did change, I changed it a long time ago. But Prettier typically has that defined. So. All right, so that's all I have. I mean, that was a lot of information. We're gonna try to add some of these. Um, Dylan's going to add all these links to the description. So thanks, Dylan. So, something <laughs> like that. Actually, <laughs> um, a, a, a good portion of these extensions are part of my Ultimate Coding Resources list repo, which mm. has things like VS Code extensions, all the text editors we talked about, courses, podcasts, blogs. So if you're interested in some of, some of that, we'll include a link to that, which has the majority of what we talked about uh, in the description below. That's so even show better. Notes. That's yep. what it's called in a podcast. Is it in the show notes? Yes, this is show notes. I'm so used to YouTube saying description, but you're right. Yeah. All right, guys. Thank you for listening and till next time. Till next time. Hey guys, thanks for watching. If you want to find more about what I'm up to, go to dylanisrael.com. And if you want to know what I'm up to, you can check out my website at eric.video. If you haven't already, please leave us a five-star review on iTunes. It really helps us out. And if you do, you might even be featured on our next episode. Don't forget to check out the website at selftaughtornot.com. From there, you can sign up for a mailing list where we give away free courses and a bunch of cool stuff. And we'll also let you know when the next episode comes out. And finally, if you didn't know, we have a Facebook group. It's called Code Tech and Caffeine. We have over 10,000 members. And you can find the link at selftaughtornot.com. So come join us. We have tons of developers willing to help you guys, mentor you guys. Check it out. Just make sure you go to selftaughtornot.com and check out the Code Tech and Caffeine link. Thanks and take care.